Hello and welcome to the Friday, May 31st, 2024 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Xavier today wrote about uh, two tools that I actually like quite a bit as well, uh, MISP and uh, OSEC. OSEC is probably the older tool among the two, and it does allow you to parse various logs and consolidate these logs, but also run scripts based on certain events that uh, happen in your logs. And that's exactly what Xavier is using here in order to automatically add any attackers that are detected by OSEC to MISP. And if you're not familiar with MISP, MISP is a database to essentially share indicators of compromise. One of the great things of MISP is it's not just a database that stores the data, it's also relatively easy to then share that data with other organizations that also run MISP. So this way you could, for example, track attackers that are coordinating attacks against the various entities and Automating this, of course, is always helpful for sort of these, I call them a little bit more nuisance alert, like uh, here, for example, he has an example with WordPress that you tend to ignore, but that can actually be an indicator of something more sinister or more severe if you do see the kind of coordination that MISP may allow you to detect. Well, then we do have a yet another update about the checkpoint vulnerability. Remember, it all started out with sort of a vague warning about brute forcing and credential stuffing happening. Yesterday, I talked about how checkpoint now says that there is an information disclosure vulnerability. Well, today, thanks to Watchtower, we do have an actual proof of concept exploit and lots and lots of detail about it. It is a directory term reversal vulnerability and as it sadly happens so often for these type of secure devices the web server is running as root and even able to access the etsy shadow file as watchtower demonstrates with its proof of concept exploit now the passwords are hashed of course in etsy shadow and uh, they're not terribly bad hashed it looks like they're 10,000 rounds of sha256 which well can be better, but it's uh, still uh, pretty difficult to brute force this. Still, if you do have a weak password, it will get brute forced uh, pretty uh, quickly. So if you patch one of the systems, I would definitely recommend that you do change passwords and uh, follow checkpoints guidance on adding additional improvements to your authentication procedures. And Lumen Labs uh, published a report regarding an interesting large attack against the Windstream. Windstream is an ISP that uh, predominantly serves rural areas. And in October last year, within a day, Windstream lost about 600,000 of its end user devices. Now, Windstream uses action tech routers, gateways. They're managed by Windstream and there was at the time no sort of recent vulnerability that could possibly explain the takeover of these devices. Best guess at this point is that it may have been some weak password that Windstream uses in order to protect those devices. And given that only Windstream is affected, even though other ISPs are using a similar device as it may be a configuration option like this that is unique to Windstream. The malware ended up pricking the devices by loading a malicious firmware update. This was more severe than some of the sort of other pricker bots and such that have been seen in the past. Many of them you could recover from by actually just rebooting the device. A reboot didn't actually help here, but the device had to be replaced. So far, there has been no real comment from Windstream about this attack, but they stated that there is an ongoing law enforcement investigation regarding uh, this attack. Windstream may have a little bit more detail as to what actually caused these devices to tip over. 
And as sometimes on Friday, I do have another science.edu student here with me to talk about his research. Michael Duncan, uh, could you introduce yourself, please? I'm Michael Duncan. I've been managing information security projects uh, for the past several years. Uh, I've been working on everything from email security and endpoint security to security automation and network segmentation. But I I know you and, and a lot of listeners didn't start out in cybersecurity. And, and that's the same for, for me. I'm a bit of a generalist. I've been uh, in IT for 25 years doing everything from application development to managing data centers. And really, I I started out cutting my teeth on administering databases, first relational databases and later uh, graph databases that are accessed through the Cypher query language. I've been in the SANS master's program now for a few years, and I've been really curious this whole time about how I can apply what I'm learning there to do more to defend those databases uh, that that I started out with. And that's why I ended up doing the research we'll talk about today. Yeah, so uh, you already mentioned one of the keywords here, Cypher. Uh, So we're not talking about the Cypher as encryption, uh, but we're talking about Cypher as in uh, query language. Everybody, I assume, that listens here knows about SQL injection. Is Cypher injection something similar or that's exactly right. Yeah. So SQL injection, you, you're you're absolutely right. It's been around for over 20 years, and I'm sure mo- most of your listeners uh, know exactly what it is. Right. That um, uh, a query injection attack is is when an application expects data, it gets code instead, and if the application doesn't cleanse that input, it could end up executing the code, and The same is is true for Cypher. So Cypher is used to query uh, graph databases like Neo4j uh, and and a few others. And uh, we discovered only three years ago that it's just as vulnerable to injection attacks as as SQL. So one of the basic bad patterns that always leads to injection attacks uh, of all kinds is that mixing of data and code, uh, where you have like a query language and then the user data, you mix in a string and execute it. Uh, Is that sort of the same thing here with Cypher injection? That's exactly it. And, you know, and just as with SQL injection, there are some best practices that uh, that people can use to, uh, to cleanse their input, right? But I think, I think we all know that, um, that you're only one bad application change away from having an application that doesn't cleanse the input. And, you know, with, with SQL injection, we have other defenses, right? Gosh, since 2002, we've had uh, intrusion detection system uh, alerts that are going to detect SQL injection. And up until now, we've not had the same sort of uh, detection for cipher injection. And that's really what, what I aim to change with my research. As much as that's possible here on an audio podcast, but can you describe a little bit what these cipher queries look like? Like what's their format? Are they going to sound like SQL or more like GraphQL, but like JSON or uh, what, what do they kind of look like? For sure. Yeah. So uh, cipher was actually inspired by SQL, so so it's going to have a lot of similar elements. But you, you're right on audio; it's a little hard to describe because it actually has ASCII art uh, as as one of the main components of of the language. So you may be may be thinking, well, if it's inspired by the SQL query language, couldn't our detections for SQL injection also detect Cipher injection? And they're because of the ASCII art; they're they're different enough that uh, that we need to develop new types of detections. Yeah. And uh, are you at least sort of have similar, like, you know, bad characters, like single quotes, double quotes, or such that cause the injection to some extent? That That's true. Yeah. The, the, uh, the single quote, uh, the, um, the tautology, uh, the one equals one, a, a lot of the, the similar markers. And what I what I discovered uh, in my research is that um, well, like we're all familiar with with you know your listeners probably know 
uh, little Bobby tables, right? That, that type yeah. of uh, SQL injection. And that's maybe a, a simpler version, but there are actually 10 different categories of, uh, of injection for, for queries that also apply to, to Cypher injection. And that's a lot of what I was trying to do in my research. I was building a set of detections. And in order to do that, I needed to make sure that I had examples from all 10 different categories. And, that, and that's, like you said, everything from, uh, from uh, single ticks to, to end a string, all the way down to really sophisticated types of attacks that are specifically designed to evade detection. Yeah. And uh, what do these detections look like? Uh, can you sort of walk us through a little bit, like uh, maybe an example? What are you looking for here and how you sort of avoid false negatives, false positives? For sure. For sure. Uh, so, so I'll first, uh, first talk a little bit about uh, what my, what my test population looked like, because that's really what, what matters. I think we've, we've all been really excited about a new type of detection that promises to, to, uh, to pick up on vulnerabilities only to discover you've just signed up for a part-time job fielding a bunch of false positives. And, so a lot of a lot of my research focused on uh, on again finding good examples of uh, of actual cipher injection, but also including a robust uh, set of benign uh, cipher uh, cipher statements, and really running all of them through uh, through Snort. So so this really was focused on using open source network intrusion detection systems. Uh, so I built uh, built a set of uh, snort rules that are using regular expressions to detect these kind of telltale signs of of cipher injection, and these are these are everything from again the the tautology the the one equals one or anything equal you know x equals x mm-hmm. uh, right that's that's probably the simplest example but. Uh, but really, also looking for uh, for things things like a, like a union, right? Because yeah. that's that's often a technique that attackers will use. Yeah, so uh, you're basically trying to do kind of the approach that people have taken with SQL and translate them uh, to Cipher. That sounds uh, like a good idea there. Uh, what about evasion uh, in SQL? There are always these famous examples, like you mentioned the or one equals one, of course, that the attacker uses two equals two. Uh, and uh, you also have some of the more tricky things, like I think SQL Server, where you can add sort of a comment inside your union statement. Uh, so you no longer have that string union. Is uh, Cypher similar, flexible, or? It, it, it really is. And, you know, and, and worse than all, there, there's one kind of, of uh, injection attack that my detections weren't that great at, uh, at picking up. Like my overall Accuracy rate was ninety two percent with zero false positives, which is which is pretty exciting, right? But but it is those those evasion attacks that really, when when you think about it, a uh, a regular expression that, that you're typically going to use in an intrusion detection system is not well suited to detect these sorts of things. And what what I found in my research is that if you go back a couple of years, that was also true for SQL injection and the uh, kind of cutting edge for for these detections on the on the SQL injection side is machine learning, which I did not do. But my goodness, just last year there were there were sixty academic articles about uh, detecting SQL injection, and most of them were about applying machine learning. Yeah. Now your paper is focusing on the detection part, uh, but you know, let's briefly talk a little bit about prevention. Do you have something like prepared statements or such in Cipher? That's right. Solve so, the basic problem. Absolutely. So, Cipher does uh, does have many of the same tools that that SQL offers, things like store procedures and uh, parameterizing input. And uh, Neo4j is is the leader in in graph databases, and they actually provide a, a good guide for uh, best practices for cleansing input, parameterizing. All, all of these things, and there's also a 
um, there, there's a scan available uh, out there that, that you can use to, uh, to determine whether your application is vulnerable uh, to injection. But like I said, you're still only one application change away from becoming yeah. vulnerable. Thanks, Michael, for joining me here uh, today. The paper will be linked in the show notes, so go ahead and take a look at it. You can also check out the research section of the sans.edu website. Thanks, everybody, for listening. That's it for today. Thanks for liking and subscribing, and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.